Well, many people don't know that he was uh, an artist. That he, I mean, an artist in the sense of, of creating artwork. So uh, the work that was selected by both Connie, Chris, and myself together, really to represent um, the many cultures uh, that, that, and a lifetime of, of um, influences on Anthony Quinn. You, uh, many people don't know he was born in Mexico. People think he's Greek. National Hellenic Museum. It's perfect because he is the, the consummate representation of, of Greek, of the Greek man. But also, uh, the word that kept coming up when we were talking was Hellenism and what Hellenism means and what the museum represents. And, and that is the, the study of a human being, the classics, the importance of the classics. Anthony Quinn was a self-taught individual, born in Mexico, raised in East LA, in a very discriminatory situation and transcended um, that, his humble beginnings to really influence and make an impact on the world of the arts, um, movies, art. Not only that, also um, just by the way he lived his life, an example of someone who loves art, lives his life through the arts, dedicated to um, making, collecting, and being an artist every day of his life. His life started off as an artist. He started off way before he was acting as an artist. He wanted to become the next Michelangelo. That was his, his life goal. Uh, he never thought he could achieve that, so his next, next closest goal was to become an architect like Frank Lloyd Wright. So when he was in high school, junior in high school, he entered a contest because he lost his father at a very young age and he didn't have any money. So he entered contests to try to win opportunities. I mean, in those days, you didn't apply for college, so you were looked for internships or opportunities to, to work and to learn. He, he never aspired to college because he just didn't have that kind of opportunity um, financially, uh, educationally. Um, even, even throughout his young days since his father died, he skipped school a lot so that he could go and work and help the family, help support the family. So this contest he entered, he won. It was a drawing contest, and he met Frank Lloyd Wright. And you know the first thing Frank Lloyd Wright said to him? You could never be an architect if you don't learn how to speak. You mumble when you speak, there's something wrong with you. And he was devastated. So he said, um, you have to go and fix your speech. Now he didn't know anything was wrong with the speech, but he did have a physical problem, he was tongue-tied. So he got, he went to a doctor. Frank Lloyd Wright sent him to a doctor. He got an operation, cut his frenulum on his tongue. And then after that kind of surgery, you need speech therapy. So he went to an acting school and begged the teacher, look, if I clean your studio, it's really dirty here, will you give me lessons? So he would do that every afternoon, go for his lessons, janitor, skip school. And he did that for months and months and months. And after, I think, nine months, she, the teacher put him in a production because he used to sit while he was cleaning the studio. She used to watch him watching the kids. It was a very privileged school for young high school kids who had money, who wanted to become actors. And he was just taken by the whole experience and worked at studying his lines. And the lines were, um, and the, the play was Noel Coward's Hay Fever. So she put him in a production, November 1933. He was 18 years old and he got the acting bug. He found out he was good at it, and he started, he joined that theater company mm -hmm. and, and traveled around with them. And then, uh, and then found out that he could earn a living doing it. But he always, went, he always did it wanting to go back to becoming an artist. So he said, I'll do this for now. I'll do this for now so that I can make some money, support my, my growing career. He, was, um, he got married when he was very young, has started having children, so it was something that was supporting him. And, and then he just kept drawing and painting. And what you'll see is also a representation of his entire lifetime dedicated to art. Some of the sketches that he did when he was very young. Um, so it's, 
So would you say that that's where his passion really was there? His passion really was there, but he just happened to become such a wonderful actor. You know why I think he was a, a wonderful actor? Because he was such a good artist. Because to be a good artist, you have to be a great observer of human beings. You have to understand people. You have to understand human nature. You have to uh, understand the depth of people. And he would observe people, homeless people, poor people, rich people. He did the most beautiful sketches. He, ca he was able to capture their expressions on their faces, their inner soul. You could see it in some of his drawings. And I think if you can do that, then you, you, in order to become a good actor, you need to be able to absorb a character or become like he did with Zorba, just become another human being I completely. How does a Mexican become a Greek like that? How does he become an Arab? How does he become a, an Indian, an Arab, you know, a, a cowboy, a Chinese warlord? A tell of the Hun, you know, all those characters that he played. Because he, because he painted and sculpted his entire life, it's really hard to, to um, you could see a theme, people, faces, human beings, so always the study of humanity, really, I think that that's probably the the, um, the theme because you see bodies, you see faces, you see expressions, and so people fascinated him. Uh, he did some nature, some landscape, but it was really um, the human body, the human face, um, women, a lot of women that he met. I think it was his way of understanding women. He, he had this he has still this reputation of being a very, a very uh, gregarious, very loud, very boisterous, Zorba-like person. But he really, he wasn't. He was, he he loved life, but he was a very tender, um, very caring um, person. Loved to go walking on the beach. Loved to be alone with his kids. So very opposite. My favorite pieces are his sketches because you can, it's like, it's like seeing into his head. You know, it's like reading his mind. It's like seeing in his heart and his soul because you can see pain, you can see joy, you can see the places he's been, you can see the things that interested him. So I have 1,700 drawings in my house and he called them doodles. He didn't call them drawings like this was a fine work of art. This was just some spontaneous sketch that he did when he was eating or on the phone, um, you know, and sometimes they're abstracts and they're joyful and they're colorful and other times they're very thoughtful and pensive and, and dark. So those are my favorite because I think you could almost, if, if I had someone to help me, you could put together a timeline of, you know, chunks, even though he didn't date those things. Uh, also, his sculptures um, in stone, he selected some of the most amazing um, onyxes and marbles, and they give the piece so much more feeling. I mean, he would do a, you know, a woman's head, but the stone just is unbelievable bright, and where, where the lines in the marble fall sometimes just light up a face, and so even if he did the two, same face twice, in two different stones, it's a completely different sculpture. Because, and I think also you see, you know, he started collecting art from a very young age. Uh, I, I have high school students come visit his studio in my home, and um, one of the young boys the other day said to me, "I'm going to start collecting art someday. Someday I want to start collecting art." And I said, "Why not now?" And he said, "Well, because I don't have, I don't have money, or I don't have the." And I, the first time Anthony Gwen bought. Uh, the first horse that he collected, he was 17 years old, he had not a dime to his name, but the person in the antique store used to see him going in every day to look at it, and he said, I'll, lend it to, I'll give it to you on, on layaway, almost like a layaway, and then he ended up paying him when he got his first job. But he also used to collect things from the flea market, or you know, when he lived in Greece, when he was making Zorba, they gave him a, a half of a house to live in. He had to transform the space. It was, you know, it was on the beach, and it was the mayor's uh, like summer home or something. And he and his friend built furniture. They went out to the flea market. They got little sculptures, little antiques to decorate the shelves. And he did that everywhere he lived. So it didn't matter if he had hundreds of thousands of dollars. He just surrounded himself with beauty wherever he was. And and that's. 
a lesson that I learned from him is that you really don't have to wait until you go to Greece or to Italy or to you bring beauty to your own life in so many different ways. What the message is, is teaching them how you can live, regardless of, a lot of people use the excuse of where they live or their dire circumstances or something that's wrong with their life that they can't achieve something. And I think seeing an example of someone who lived 100 years ago under very dire circumstances, I mean, with no father in the neighborhood he, he grew up in, I mean, his circumstances were pretty poor. Although, if you had asked him at that time, were you poor when you were a kid? He, he said, I, would, I didn't know I was poor until I, until I saw rich people. So until you compare yourself. So the way they lived, even as poor people, was still with dignity, was still with beauty, and still with pride. And so I think that if people, if kids learn that, then they take a different approach instead of looking at someone else and saying, I'll never have that. Because the first instinct when people come to my house is they say, well, he was lucky he had all this. And I said, well, he wasn't lucky. He worked every single day. And, and that's something that is, is, is really hard to teach and also hard to learn, that you, you have to work at it every day. He wasn't lucky. I, I mean, maybe he got a break now and then, but he worked every single day. And when Frank Lloyd Wright told him, you have a problem with your speech, you can't become an architect, he could have gone home and said, oh, I hate that man, he was so mean to me. Like many, you know, teenagers, I have, my, I have two kids of my own, now they're 21 and 18, but how many times they said to me, oh, I wish I had this. I said, well, you know, everyone has something wrong, but if you just use that as a crutch, then you'll just keep on carrying that load on your back, but just work around it or use it. Now we have 63 kids in our alumni, or 15 this year, but and before that another 40, 45. Or it's amazing to see them. So we've been doing it five years, and to see the kids coming back and saying that that experience, the summer program that they went to, because it's a for a summer program, yeah, not for colleges. Exactly. So are the kids kids are from around the country. They're all high school kids. And using him as the example because his his change life changing time came in high school when he met Frank Lloyd Wright, and I think very often once kids get to high school, a lot of people forget about them. They think they're too difficult. You know, kids are creative when they're young. They're playful when they're young. They go through middle school, then they get very. Um, uh, some of them get very interior. You know. Um, withdrawn because they don't want to stand out. I saw it happen with my own daughter. And so it's bringing out what their talents are. And so they apply to us. They tell us where they want to go. It's a summer intensive program that they apply to. Now it could be around the country, around the world. Some kids have gone to Italy, Ireland, um, London, Chicago, New York, Rhode Island. So they'll say, I want to go to the Hubbard School for Dance. And it's all the arts as well, dance, music, singing, poetry, um, visual art, acting, digital media, all, all across the board. And I think now we have kids from almost every discipline who have applied. And they submit essays, almost like a college application. It's very intense. You got to want it. And you have to also put in some of the money. So when you pick a program, you've got to pick a program that you can half afford to help us pay for because we want to, them to have some skin in the game as well. Not just give them a check and go off and go to school. They don't appreciate it as much as when they, they put in. I don't know if you have kids, but when, when you make them put up some of their own money, it's a, it's a different yeah, story. I, I <laughs> money, so you know what it feels yes. like. Yeah, you're too young. <laughs>